Get ready to gain the definitive answer to the question we've all asked. Did we come from monkeys? What if I told you that the most famous image of human evolution, the one in books, on t-shirts, and all over the internet, is completely wrong, and that the answer to our origin isn't a straight line, but a vast and winding family tree with more lost branches than we can possibly imagine? Today we embark on the greatest journey of all, not to the stars, but into the deep past, to the evolutionary crossroads where our destiny was sealed. Forget the simplistic yes or no, the truth is far more incredible. Let's get straight to the point and shatter the biggest myth of all. The question, did we come from monkeys, is poorly phrased. The short and simple answer is, no, we did not evolve from any of the species of monkeys or chimpanzees that exist today. Thinking that way is like saying you came from your cousin. You didn't come from your cousin. You both share the same grandparents. And that is exactly how evolution works. We, Homo sapiens, and modern chimpanzees and bonobos, our closest living relatives, share a common ancestor. A species of primate that lived millions of years ago and was neither a chimpanzee nor a human. At some point in the deep past, the population of this ancestral species split into at least two groups. Modern genetics through comparative genome studies led by institutions like the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, estimates that this separation occurred between 6 and 8 million years ago. One group followed an evolutionary path that over millions of natural selection gave rise to today's chimpanzees and bonobos. The other group followed a different path a path that eventually led to us. Think of it like a family tree. The common ancestor is the main trunk. From it, two main branches split off, the pan branch, which leads to chimpanzees, and the hominin branch, which leads to us. We are at the tip of one of these branches, and chimpanzees are at the tip of the other. We are close relatives with DNA that is, according to these same studies, about 98.8% identical. But one did not come from the other. We are sister evolutionary lines that have not intersected for millions of years. To find the moment of this separation, we need to travel in time and space. Our story begins in Africa, the undisputed cradle of humanity, during the late Miocene period. At that time, much of the continent was covered by dense, continuous tropical forests. Our primate ancestors lived in the trees, adapted for a life of climbing and swinging, an arboreal existence. But the planet was changing. Powerful tectonic forces began to stretch and tear the Earth's crust in the eastern part of the continent, a process that would eventually create the Great Rift Valley, a geological scar visible from space. This massive geological barrier dramatically altered climate patterns. The west remained humid, preserving the forests, but the east in the shadow of the new mountains began to become progressively drier and more seasonal. The tropical forests shrank, fragmented, and gave way to a new and challenging environment, the savanna, a mosaic of open woodlands and vast grasslands. This change was a catastrophe for many species, but for others it was an opportunity. For our ancestors living in the east, the savanna floor was a new and dangerous place, full of predators like saber-toothed cats and giant hyenas. But it was also full of new food sources, like roots, tubers, and animal carcasses. And it was here, in this arena of danger and opportunity, that the first great adaptation of our lineage arose, 
an adaptation that defines us to this day and marks the beginning of our branch on the tree of life. Bipedalism, the act of walking on two legs. For a long time, the popular idea was that the big brain came first, that our intelligence is what made us human. But the fossil evidence has told us a different and much more interesting story. The first thing that separated us from other apes was our posture. And the oldest and most spectacular evidence of this comes from Chad in the heart of Africa. In 2001, a team led by French paleontologist Michel Brunet discovered a fossilized skull nearly 7 million years old. It was nicknamed Tumai, which means hope of life in the local language. Tumai, of the species Sahelanthropus chadensis, had a tiny brain, about 350 cubic centimeters, the same size as a chimpanzee's. Its teeth and face were a mixture of primitive traits, but it held a revolutionary secret at the base of its skull, the foramen magnum, the hole where the spinal cord connects to the brain. In quadrupeds like chimpanzees, which walk on their knuckles, this hole is positioned at the back of the skull, at an angle. In Tumai, it was positioned directly underneath the skull, centrally. There is only one reason for this anatomy. It held its head erect and balanced on a vertical spine. Tumai walked on two legs. Why was this change so important? Walking upright on the savanna freed the hands, which were previously used for locomotion, for a universe of new possibilities, carrying food to safe places, carrying tools, and crucially, carrying helpless infants. Standing up gave it a higher vantage point to spot predators over the tall grass, and as biomechanical studies show, it is a much more energy-efficient way of moving over long distances, which is essential in the sparse savanna. It was a risky bet, one that made us slower and more unstable, but it paid off. Tumai, and other contemporaries like Auroran Tuganensis from Kenya were the pioneers. They were not human, but they took the first literal step on the path that would lead to humanity. Walking on two legs was the first great revolution of our lineage. Considering the dangers of the savanna, what do you think was more impactful about this change? the ability to carry things with free hands, or the ability to see farther to avoid predators. Leave your opinion below. After millions of years of evolutionary experimentation with different types of bipeds, a new group of hominins emerged and dominated the African landscape for over a million years, the Australopithecines. And the undisputed star of this group is Lucy discovered in 1974 by Donald Johansson in Hadar, Ethiopia. The skeleton of Lucy, an Australopithecine afarensis from 3.2 million years ago, has given us an incredibly detailed picture of what it was like at this crucial stage of our evolution. Lucy was small, just over a meter tall. Her skeleton from the neck down was a fascinating mix of the old and the new. Her pelvis was low and wide, and the angle of her femur to her knee was very similar to ours, features unequivocally adapted for efficient upright walking. The famous Laetuli footprints in Tanzania, preserved in volcanic ash 3.6 million years ago by Mary Lakey, confirmed this spectacularly. They showed two or three individuals of Lucy's species walking together, on two legs, with an almost modern gait. But Lucy had not completely abandoned the past. Her arms were long in proportion to her legs, and her fingers and toes were long and curved, traits perfect for grasping branches. This tells us that, although they were efficient bipeds on the ground, they still spent a lot of time in the trees, likely to gather fruit, to escape from predators, and to sleep safely at night. Lucy lived a hybrid life between two worlds, the savanna floor 
and the safety of the trees. And her brain? It was still small, about 450 cubic centimeters, only slightly larger than a chimpanzee's. She and her species were proof that bipedalism long preceded the big brain, but her lineage was getting ready for the next great revolution. Around 2.5 million years ago, something changed. The African climate became even drier and more unstable, and the competition for plant-based foods became fierce. It was in this pressure cooker scenario that a new genus arose, a genus to which we belong, the genus Homo. The first known member is Homo habilis, the handyman found in places like Olduvai Gorge, Tanzania, by the legendary Lewis and Mary Lakey, Hobilis had a noticeably larger brain than Lucy, exceeding 600 cubic centimeters. And along with its fossils, we find the key to this change, the first stone tools of the Olduwan industry. They were simple pebbles flaked to create a sharp edge, but they represent an unprecedented cognitive revolution for the first time, an ancestor of ours was planning, visualizing a tool inside a rock, selecting the right material, and executing a complex sequence of actions to create it. These tools opened up a new and rich menu. They allowed Homo habilis to do something its predecessors could not, process animal carcasses left by large predators. With the sharp flakes, they could cut through thick hide and meat. With the larger core stones, they could smash open bones to access the marrow, an incredibly rich and protected source of fat and calories. More meat and fat in the diet meant more energy, and this extra energy fueled the body's hungriest organ, the brain, which consumes 20% of our energy. A positive feedback loop began. Bigger brains created better tools, which gave access to higher quality food, which in turn supported even bigger brains. The genus Homo was born. The next step in this saga was taken by one of the most successful humans of all time, Homo erectus. Emerging nearly two million years ago, erectus was different. It was tall, with long legs and short arms, and body proportions very similar to ours. The famous skeleton of the Turkana boy from Kenya shows a youth who, as an adult, would have stood over 1.8 meters tall. Its brain was much larger, reaching 900 cubic centimeters, and its tools, of the Acheulean industry, like the teardrop-shaped hand axe, were much more symmetrical, standardized, and complex, indicating a new level of planning and abstract thought. Homo erectus was a master of adaptation. It was the first to lose most of its body hair and develop the ability to sweat efficiently, becoming a formidable endurance runner, capable of hunting by chasing prey to exhaustion under the African sun, a technique known as persistence hunting. And it mastered a force of nature that changed everything, fire. Evidence of controlled hearths like those found in Wonderwork Cave in South Africa dates back over a million years. Fire provided warmth, protection from predators, a social gathering place, and, crucially, the ability to cook. Cooking food makes it easier to digest, releases far more nutrients, and kills parasites. The time spent chewing was drastically reduced, and the energy gained was immense. Armed with this technology, an adapted body, and a larger brain, Homo erectus did what no hominin before it had done. It left Africa. Over a period of one and a half million years, it spread across Asia, reaching as far as China and Indonesia, and into Europe. It was the first true global human, the pioneer who proved that our lineage was no longer bound to a single continent. The path to Homo sapiens was now set. Two revolutions defined Homo erectus, advanced stone tools and the mastery of fire. In your opinion, which of these two innovations was more important for our journey to conquer the planet? 
Leave your opinion in the comments. So, did we come from monkeys? No. We and modern apes share a common ancestor, and from there we followed radically different evolutionary paths. Our journey was not a straight line, but a tree full of branches, many of which ended in dead ends. It was a story of adaptation, of challenges and innovations that defined us. The courageous step onto the savanna floor, the freeing of the hands, the invention of tools, the mastery of fire, and the growth of a brain capable of imagining, planning, and cooperating. Every fossil, every stone tool, is a chapter in this incredible saga. And if you want to gain more knowledge about our amazing journey and the lost worlds our ancestors inhabited, then you are in the right place. Continue this exploration with us. Subscribe to Extinct Doc and hit the bell so you don't miss a single chapter of our past. Leave a like if this story changed your view of our origins and share this video with everyone who has ever asked the big question. Where did we come from? Your interaction is the fuel that allows us to continue unearthing the greatest story of all. Thank you for watching and see you next time.